welcome to this week's edition of I Africa, your show that keeps you entertained and plugged in on everything arts and the creative industry. We have a beauty queen this week. We also have a stonemason, the very people, Waka Waka Zimba Zimbabwe. And we also have a chef. As you can see, it's a vast array of creativity. Stay tuned. Be entertained. This is I Africa. I Africa searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture, from fashion and design through to architecture, art, food, and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects, who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugarim Duhani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated, and future-oriented. I Africa, celebrating the African story. In this first segment of I Africa, I'm going to be talking to Universal Woman Zimbabwe, Shelly Bent, who's going to be talking about her journey in the pageantry industry. If you want to be a beauty queen, stay tuned. This is your segment. In our first segment, I'm joined by Universal Woman Zimbabwe, Shelly Bent. Hi Shelley. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me, firstly. What yes. an honor. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little about yourself and your background? Sure. So I am Shelley Bent, 31 years old. I'm a mother of two. My eldest is 13 and my youngest is actually two and a half. An absolute sassy little pants. <laughs> um, and my son is just the protective big brother. But I run my own business. I'm a beauty therapist. And yeah, competing in pageants was something that I wanted to do for a broader spectrum in terms of reaching people and my advocacy. Um, and that's mental health and substance abuse and that's what I stand for. And basically bringing awareness and breaking the stigma on that topic. Um, other than that, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a businesswoman. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a lifestyle coach. Uh, I don't know, there's just so much. Okay, so for those that are unfamiliar with uh, the pa pageant that you took part in and you're the reigning queen, yes? Yes, yes? Can you tell us what Universal Woman is all about? Sure, so Universal Woman stands for woman empowerment, so to empower everybody who is around you, hence why there is no miss or misses in the title itself because we do not discriminate. So you could be married, you could have kids, you could be divorced, you could be in school. Um, yeah, it's just a diverse pageant, which I love and I appreciate because we, we take honor in, you know, bringing in womanhood and making sure that we do not discriminate against anybody. You have taken part in quite a number of pageants locally. Yes. What have you taken out of them? What have you learned from them? Oh goodness, so obviously my first major pageant was Miss Universe Zimbabwe. I was able to come top eight, which was absolutely phenomenal, very blessed. And that taught me to be diverse, to be able to work with people within the industry, make a community, as well as to break boundaries. I mean, I was the first married woman to compete this year in Universal Miss Universe. Um, and then a month after that, I was in Universal Woman. So it's crazy because a lot of people say that, you know, I was insane to take part in pageants literally months apart or weeks apart, actually, um, because it's so intense in terms of preparation, having to prepare yourself mentally and physically. And I think that's what I hold close to my heart is the discipline, the structure that pageantry can give you and the discipline to be yourself and to know that anything is possible. To be able to be diverse and work with people within the industry who you can learn and grow with as well as compete. And obviously winning the crown is a benefit in itself, but I think the bigger picture of pageantry is being able to be diverse and working with people around you. The structure, the building a community, building um, 
a workplace, basically. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a work transaction, yeah. Yeah. Well, you speak of motherhood and also being an entrepreneur. How do you balance the commitments between being a pageant queen yeah. and also your personal life? Oh, I'm still learning. <laughs> it's a process. It's a process, yeah. no. Um, it's sometimes got its ups and downs because obviously splitting one person into many different places can be tiresome in itself. So I just need to remember to be able to take time for myself, whether that's in quiet time, whether that's in prayer, whether that's going for a mani pedi or being able to pamper myself because I've given so much of myself. Because at the end of the day, if my cup is not full, I will not be able to pour into one, my advocacy, which is huge part of what I'm doing and what I'm standing for, as well as the pageantry side, which is the beauty and all the glitz and glam. So yeah, I do have a tendency to split myself a bit too much. But I love giving back to the community. I love being there for my family. I'm very much a hands-on parent um, and wife. And I'm just, yeah, I'm all over the place, but I love it. I love, I love structure, but I also love the chaos of working in the structure. Well, you spoke of you being in health and wellness, yes. beauty and wellness, mm -hmm. and you're a beauty queen. What's your take on women of color? Yeah. Um, you know, taking what they take to change and then not being comfortable in their own skin yeah. and bleaching and all of that. Like, what's your take on that and what's your okay. advice to them? Well, firstly, from a beauty side of things, um, bleaching is something that is not good for your skin at all. Um, I understand why people do it um, because of the stigma that is behind beauty and being lighter or, you know, for us as well, you know, Caucasian, some of us are lighter than usual and want to have a tan and want to be tanned and want to um, look a little bit darker like we've sun kissed. But either or, both aspects of or both spectrums of that beauty side of your skin and who you are, I think it comes down to confidence because either way, whether you're going to sit in the sun for hours, you're still getting sun damage. And if you're going to bleach, you're still bleaching your beautiful melanin skin that God gave you. And you are unique in your own skin. You are your own person. Nobody else can copy you. So why change to be somebody else? Why change to, you know, try and be per perfect in society's eyes? Why not be perfect in your own eyes? Because you are one of a kind. There's nobody like you. So stand up and be confident. That's what I believe. You've spoken like a true queen. <laughs> What are some of the challenges that you have encountered in the local pageantry uh, industry and also what changes would you like to see? So I haven't seen or haven't really had any negative or don't have any negative feedback in terms of pageantry. I've actually enjoyed my process, like I said earlier, working with different, very talented Zimbabweans. And I think that's what I love about the pageant side of things is that we can grow and learn within different industries whether that's photography whether that's videography whether that's you know radio stations um, designers shoe designers whatever it is makeup artists hairstylists um, there are so many talented people in this country in this nation that we get to work with and we are blessed and honored to be able to work with them and build a rapport with them and later on have a community that we can say we've helped uplift. And I think that's the benefit of pageantry. You're not only a queen for your nation, but you're a queen for the team that you work with. Because at the end of the day, you're giving them a platform for them to grow and for their success too. Because your success story is their success story. Just like our success story as queens for Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe's success story too. And for us to uphold and uplift the flag for Zimbabwe. So I think there's a lot of opportunity with pageantries and ability to grow more. Um, if that's one thing I could say is maybe for us to grow more and for people to become more aware. I find that being a title holder um, in different spectrums of Zimbabwe and different cultures of Zimbabwe, a lot of Zimbabweans don't actually know about pageantry. They don't know that we've got so many 
titles in pageantry. So I think maybe that would be an aspect that I would say needs to change for pageantry is more awareness, more awareness of what we stand for, what of our advocacies, what do the women want to do to impact Zimbabwe as a whole? Because we are not just there for beauty, we actually have a purpose and a goal at the end of the day for our causes, for people who we want to support and sponsor. Um, and I think that is the bigger picture so that Zimbabweans can also get on board as a community and for us to be able to make the difference together. What's your advice to someone who wants wow. to get into the pageantry industry? <laughs> That's always a big question because yes. I have so much, so much to give. Poor us. Um, I would say if you're going to get into the industry, be confident in yourself because there's always going to be somebody who may look prettier, who may have more, who, you know, may have a better opportunity. But at the end of the day, it's about you. It's about what you can bring to the table. And if you're a hard worker and you're dedicated and you're disciplined enough to make the stand and be able to make the difference, not only for you and your your advertisement as the title holder, but for Zimbabwe and for your nation, and to be proud, be proud of who you are, be proud of where you come from, um, because I think that's what makes the difference between just a queen and a queen for her country. Yeah. Beautiful words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Of course. Thank you for having me. That has been Universal Woman of Zimbabwe, Shelley Bent, right here on iAfrica. That has been Universal Woman Zimbabwe, Shelly Bent, right here on iAfrica. Stay tuned for the next segment. iAfrica searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture. From fashion and design through to architecture, art, food and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugare Mdukwani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated and future-oriented. I Africa, celebrating the African story. I Africa searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture. From fashion and design through to architecture, art, food and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects, who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugare Mdukwani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated, and future-oriented. I Africa, celebrating the African story. Welcome to the second segment of I Africa, where we will be interviewing stonemason Joby Wheatley. joined by master stonemason Joby Wheatley. Hello Joby. How are you? I'm well thank you. How are you doing? Good thank you. Good. Can you tell us about your background and how you became a stonemason? So I left school at 15 and I went into bricklaying. I did four year apprenticeship where I got a distinction in advanced brickwork. Did that for a few years and then that became boring. So I was lucky enough to be put in contact with a master stonemason, award-winning Geraint Davis, and he took me on, and since then I've never looked back. Now, how long have you been working in the field, and what drew you, aside from him pulling you aside, what drew you to the passion and the art of stonemasonry? So it's a lot more intricate, it's more mentally intense, you have to really think, and it's physically demanding as well, which I love. And it's just the creativity you get. With, when you do brickwork, it's brick, brick, brick. With stonework, you have to think about every stone. What types of projects do you primarily work on, and what are the essential skills required 
for a stonemason? So I specialise in ancient monuments. I've built all six of the last long barrows built in the United Kingdom in the last 5,000 years. And they are domed structures which can be used for multiple applications, prayer, entertainment, social tourism. So that's prominently what I do. Uh, but I can do anything from brides to fire pits to house builds. You're only limited by your imagination. We've seen on social media your drive, one million stones. What is the inspiration behind your one million stones drive? So I, before I leave Earth, <laughs> I would like to have laid one million stones in Zimbabwe. I would also like to have trained people and then each person I train will have the obligation to also lay one million stones. So it's an incentive to increase with restoration work on the ruins and also new monuments so we can get back the houses of stone. Oh, that's beautiful. There are stone structures in other countries in Southern Africa, like for instance, South Africa, Zambia, Mozambique. What drew your heart to Zimbabwe? So my wife is Zimbabwean, which is very important, but this is also the houses of stone. But I did not know that until I came here. So I had a dream one day while I was in the UK. It was a very powerful dream, and it was very simply, go to Zimbabwe. Wow. <laughs> so some might argue, why is a foreigner coming to teach us? I mean, we are the original stonemasons. You are. <laughs> yes. Uh, what is your response to them? So I've had meetings with the chief curator at the National Museum of Monuments Zimbabwe, and he, he specified to me that you are losing your stonemasons, your traditional heritage style stonemasons. You have 137 monuments here and you haven't got the broad spectrum of people needed to help. So I feel that I now have an obligation to help. So if, if, if some people think, yes, I am a foreigner, I am British, we all know about the history of British people, but I'm here to help and help reignite the Houses of Stone. In what ways do you strive to incorporate creativity into your work as a stonemason? So firstly, when I speak to the clients, I get a feel for what they need, what they want. I will then go away and just look for inspiration. I will also ask other people what will inspire them. Creativity is important, but you must also listen to the landscape of where you're working. You can't go into an environment and think you know what's best. You must go to the environment and listen to the landscape and then draw inspiration from that. Simply, basically what our ancestors were doing when they were building exactly. the houses of stone. Are there any certifications or training programs you would recommend for aspiring stonemasons? As it stands, I'm not aware that there are any. That you get certification. So when I had my meetings with the National Museum of Monuments, I said, I will start an academy, and if you give me authority to sign off, I can put them through a level one, two, or three. So if you want to do the basics, level one, fine. If you want to do advanced, you'd stay to level three. So what I'm looking for is the authority to give a certification, and then I can give the stamp all through the government, all through the National Museum of Monuments, or University of Zimbabwe. What advice would you give to someone who's watching you right now, who has been inspired by your drive and your passion for stonemasonry? And obviously, you are a living master stonemason. What advice would you give to them uh, considering a career in masonry? DM me. <laughs> Message me. My social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I had to join TikTok to keep up with the kids. <laughs> But yeah, DM me, message me. I'm open or message the great uh, the National Museum of Monuments. Just reach out. Um, my DMs are open to everyone and I answer everyone the message. <laughs>
iAfrica searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture, from fashion and design through to architecture, art, food, and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects, who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugare Mdohani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated, and future-oriented. I, Africa, celebrating the African story. Africa searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture, from fashion and design through to architecture, art, food, and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects, who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugare Mdohani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated, and future-oriented. I, Africa, celebrating the African story. I'm now joined by Chef Itai of Bird's Nest. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Chef. Hi, how are you doing? I love the get up. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Simple, don't keep it, don't complicate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, can you tell us a bit about your background? Who are you? Right. And, you know, tell us about Bird's Nest. All right, Bird's Nest. Um, so, my name, as you said, Chef Itai. Um, I was born and bred in Zimbabwe. Um, I was lucky to go abroad uh, to do a couple of degrees. First being a business degree, then a food degree. Um, in the beginning, uh, I couldn't do my food degree because uh, my parents were supporting me through university. So they said, you know, uh, you can't do a food degree first because it doesn't really pay. Um, but I think this is a struggle with most chefs uh, coming out of, especially in African countries. Uh, but I understand why. Um, so as it was my passion, uh, it went full circle. Ten years later, I eventually came back to the industry. Uh, I've been in the industry almost eight commercially. Uh, I've worked in hotels abroad, uh, and this is my first food thing in Zimbabwe. Uh, I relocated uh, to come and get married. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, and then my contract was supposed to be renewed uh, in December uh, by one of the top five hotels in the world. Uh, so I said, what am I going to do till December? And that's where birdsiness comes into play. Okay. Yes. Well... I have a vast array before me. Yes. Yes, and, and this, is this a soup? Is it a sauce? So it's a broth. Uh -huh. uh, broth is what makes the ramen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, anyone can tell you a lot of things. If the broth is not good, the ramen will never be good. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. So you're going to take us through a plating as we converse? Yes, 100%. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to do two, two plates for you today. We're going to do bear buns. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of getting crazy now locally. And then uh, we're going to do a nice uh, ramen bowl for you. Okay. Okay. And uh, hopefully you get to taste. So what cuisines are you most comfortable with and which do you enjoy prepping the most? Which do I enjoy prepping the most? Yes. Uh, so I've been um, trained in Creole cuisine and Mediterranean cuisine. Um, but when I came back here, I thought there was a bit of a gap for the Asian cuisine. Mm. Uh, we also have a large array of... Asians, you know, migrating to Zimbabwe for one reason or another, uh, as well as the locals are uh, trying to new stuff, right? Yes. So I saw a gap there, which is why I decided to go Afro-Asian. But to answer your question, I can cook anything. Uh, our flagship line of business is the high-end dining, where you get to pick your own menu, uh, own cuisine, and then we do three to seven courses for you. Uh, in high high end dining, and uh, that's what we've been doing mostly, and it's uh, starting to pick up. A lot of people uh, along the lines of there's many elements in a certain dish. Uh, 
a regular home dish uh for example rice and chicken curry the one of the most popular ones in zimbabwe uh your rice should have something sweet uh something bitter uh and maybe a crunch so maybe you can add sunflower seeds to it uh celery or even um blueberries and it'll change the texture profile of your rice it'll take regular rice and make it extra extra that. Well, that's something new, <laughs> blueberries and rice. <laughs> yes, you should try it, trust me. Definitely. Yeah. Do you have a signature dish Do I have a that signature? you've created that you're particularly proud of? All right. Uh, I haven't done it today, but the dish I made in culinary school uh, was actually sadza. Uh, <laughs> I was in Greece and they very much loved it. Uh, so it was sadza with oxtail. Uh, I'd have to show you the pictures. I can't really explain it, mm. but <laughs> but yeah, I, I like my traditional food. Uh, so people shouldn't be scared that we offer high end cuisine that we don't do traditional as well. But yeah. So what is in this particular plate? Ooh, this it's looking <coughs> really uh, colorful. Yes. So in this plate, you've got your. This is a beef ramen. Uh, we've got the sesame seeds for taste and crunch. Uh, we have the egg noodle. We've got the celery that we once mentioned, uh, the green onion, and then uh, we have our braised vegetables, uh, bok choy, purple cabbage, and uh, white cabbage. Um, so yeah, that's the dish there. And then we finish it with a bit of chili oil and sesame oil. Lovely, lovely, yes. lovely. Thank you for tuning in to this segment of I Africa, where I took you through a creative journey, very mixed right there, where first of all in the first segment, we had universal woman, Shelly Bent, and then we went on over to the master stonemason, Joby Whitley, and we wrapped it all up with Chef Itai, who took us through the plating of his beef ramen and the bun. Thank you for tuning in and tune in next week for the next segment of I Africa. I Africa searches for inspiration and innovation in all areas of popular culture, from fashion and design through to architecture, art, food, and travel. The focus is on outstanding individuals doing extraordinary things on the African continent. The show presents creatives in their home nations, visiting renowned designers, musicians, architects, who are leaving their mark on the young continent. Join me, your host, Rugarim Duhani, as we take a round trip across Africa and get to be inspired, motivated, and future-oriented. I Africa, celebrating the African story.